So welcome everybody to this uh, next session of CLINAM. Um, I, I should start by saying a huge thank you to Biet and the rest of the CLINAM team for persevering with, uh, with, with the meeting in these such unusual times that we find ourselves in. So this session is entitled Integrated Assessment of Pharmacokinetics for Nanomedicine Development. Uh, we've got some superb speakers uh, lined up for the, the for the session. Um, I'm just going to give a very basic introduction to the uh, subject matter um, over the first ten minutes or so of the uh, of the of, of the session, and then I'll introduce uh, the speakers as we move through the afternoon. So, just as an introduction to the importance of pharmacokinetics. Um, we can think about pharmacokinetics and how it underpins effective medicine development, um, as well as the way that it underpins deployment and optimization of medicines. Um, classically, we've been doing this for 30, 40 years of uh, drug development for small molecules and other therapeutics. And if we think about drug development from research and development and lead selection through preclinical development, clinical development, launch and post licensing for medicines, then pharmacokinetics is routinely considered at all stages of development and the lifespan uh, of, a, of a drug. So typically in research and development phase through to the preclinical development phase, we'll be starting to think about early in vitro understanding of drug disposition. We'll be looking at things like the affinity for drug transporter proteins. We'll be thinking about drug metabolism um, before moving into in vivo preclinical validation of the pharmacokinetics, where we start for oral medicines to get a understanding of the bioavailability of a drug um, or start to understand in vivo what the rate of clearance of the drug from the systemic compartment is, as well as trying to understand the dose linearity um, before we uh, move into clinical development. And it's really at these early stages that we start to get our first understanding of the exposure response relationship um, uh, and how it relates to the efficacy or safety of the drug that it moves forward. And we might also be using this early pharmacokinetic understanding to do our first human dose predictions. As we move into clinical development, um, we start to get our first understanding of human pharmacokinetics, the bioavailability in humans, the clearance in humans, and the dose linearity in humans. Um, and we'll start as we move through clinical development to understand the pharmacodynamics and the exposure response relationship uh, in human patient populations. After a drug is launched, it's quite common for uh, uh, understanding of pharmacokinetics to continue to develop. We'll, we'll be starting to think about clinical management and optimization of therapies. We'll be thinking about drug-drug interactions and which drugs can be given together in certain situations. We'll be thinking about how pharmacokinetics changes in different populations, so during pregnancy or in pediatric patients. Um, there may be a, a requirement for dose optimization um, uh, post-marketing. And we, we also use pharmacokinetics to understand variability in populations, such as variability that comes from uh, genetic factors, which predispose uh, certain enzymes or transporter systems. So route of administration is clearly an uh, important uh, determinant of the pharmacokinetics. Um, almost all drugs which are administered fall into one of these two shapes of pharmacokinetic profile. So we have time on post-dose on the x-axis of both these graphs. Typically for oral administration, we'll have an absorption phase reaching Cmax before clearance phase, and in many cases, we'll dose again when before the drug levels uh, drop too low. For intravenous administration, which is important for many uh, types of nanomedicine, um, we usually start with a very high concentration, which is then rapidly cleared from the systemic compartment. Of course, 
often when you see a graphic of pharmacokinetics, it's a single concentration time profile. But we also have to understand that um, uh, for many indications, if not most indications, we need to ach achieve steady state pharmacokinetics. So when you, when you dose multiple doses of a drug, your concentrations will rise over time until they reach a point where they're stable. And hopefully this keeps the concentrations within the therapeutic window of the drug. And at that point, we've achieved steady state pharmacokinetics and different medicines, different drugs will take different periods of time in order to reach this steady state pharmacokinetics. Now, this is important because single dose pharmacokinetics is often not very um, informative in the context of the overall exposure response relationship for a medicine. Pharmacokinetics is critical to understand that you're in that therapeutic range. We can think about Emax models, concentration effect models, where we try to determine the effective concentrations of the drug. Um, and, and, and then when we think about concentrations in human populations, we need to think about the probability of the either achieving the therapeutic effect shown in green or the uh, unintended consequence, the toxicity of the drug shown in red. And of course, the goal is to stay within the therapeutic index where you're maximizing the probability of efficacy while keeping the probability of toxicity to a minimum. Of course, in real world situations, it's, it's, it's very unlikely to be like the pretty graphs that we show uh, for population level PK. And this is just some data for an antiretroviral drug uh, that we did probably 10 years ago now, where you see the concentration, each one of these dots being the concentration in a different patient. So you can see huge variability of in pharmacokinetics occurs within populations, uh, within patient populations, even administered the same dose. And of course, this is important because you have a higher probability of drug failure or medicine failure at low concentrations and a much higher probability of uh, encountering toxicity issues at the higher concentrations. Classical DMPK, drug metabolism, pharmacokinetics, we think about transporters, um, which are um, uh, uh, around 10 nanometers in, dia in, in height, 8 nanometers in diameter, uh, metabolic enzymes, similar size to the transporters. But when we bring a nanoparticle into this situation, you can immediately see, and this is just a 100 nanometer nanoparticle, you can immediately see that the considerations are going to be very different for a nanoparticle than they are for a small molecule drug. But nanoparticles sometimes release drugs. So some of the excipients, the carrier materials may actually be subject to metabolism by these classical DMPK pathways. There's also additional properties of nanoparticles. We think about size, we think about surface charge, crystallinity, surface functionality, drug release kinetics. And again, we're releasing drugs in many cases. And I think it's fair to say at the moment, we're trying to understand this balance between the classical DMPK of the drug, which is loaded within the nanoparticle versus the influence of the particle properties themselves. Nanomedicines uh, have different clearance mechanisms, different distribution mechanisms. We're all familiar with the reticuloendothelial system as an alternative route of clearance. There's also uh, uh, specific kidney filtration systems which apply to nanomedicines. So we have to consider all of these things when we're, when we're thinking about intact nanoparticles. Nanomedicines are complex. They're clearly complex. Many of the advanced nanomedicines consist of complex architectures, diverse material compositions, excipients, polymers, lipids, in some cases, inorganic carrier type materials. And, and, and for at least some of these functional materials and materials can drive or help drive the therapeutic effect or stabilize the pharmacokinetics. But unlike for small molecule drug delivery, every component requires a sound understanding of its pharmacokinetics and of its concentration effect relationship. 
So the therapeutic drug payload need to be achieved while maintaining a safe exposure to the other materials that we're using in order to deliver that therapeutic component. So we might understand the drug pharmacokinetics and the influence of the, the nanomaterial on the drug pharmacokinetics, but we also need to understand what the carrier material is doing. We also need to understand what the excipients are doing, and we need to understand the, uh, the exposure response in terms of the uh, safety uh, for all the components of these various materials. So that's just a whistle stop tour of the introduction uh, to the session. Um, like I said earlier, we've got some great speakers. Um, uh, I'll just move quickly now on to the uh, uh, first speaker, who's, uh, who I'm sure requires very little in, in way of an introduction to many of us. Um, and uh, Professor Alberto Gab Gabizon will be talking to us about pharmacokinetic and clinical correlations of pegylated liposomal mitomycin C pool drug in colorectal cancer patients. Thank you, Albert. Um, thank you, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Owen, for this great introduction. Uh, I will now uh, hopefully share my screen. No, yeah, okay, maybe now I'm allowed to do it. Um, okay, share. Um, and I hope uh, everyone can see the screen. Um, so um, I will talk uh, mainly today about uh, Promethil, which is a lipidic, a lipidic product of mitomycin C in liposomes, which we have been developing clinically for the last uh, uh, six, seven years. And uh, we have worked out from bench to bedside, from, to bedside the road of development. And uh, we'll go to the next uh, slide. Uh, OK, my disclosures um, uh, um, uh, related to Lipomedics and also to a new company called Lefco Pharmaceuticals and some of the grant support I get from companies. So uh, this. Uh, slide is just a quick slide to uh, point at the at uh, the fact that uh, when we introduce a liposome associated drug in into the intravascular compartment we have several pathways of elimination competing for and uh, and uh, one of them is as as already as uh, professor Owen mentioned is the conventional liposome conventional nanoparticle uptake by the res the other one is the possibility of leaking drug while the liposomes are in circulation. And the third pathway of elimination, which is the most uh, um, desired one, is the long circulation aiming at the EPR effect with the uh, localization in the tumors. And uh, here we need a long circulating and stable nanoparticle. And uh, we have known now for many years that there is a direct correlation between nanoparticle circulation time and tumor uptake. And this is a slide uh, that shows beautifully the EPR effect. It highlights the, as you see here in the, in the leg of this mouse, the uptake um, by the tumor uh, of the radio-labeled liposomes, uh, which can reach very high levels. In this case, up to 25% of the injected dose per gram in some areas of the tumor. But likewise, you can see that uh, reticular endothelial system is also taking up a large, uh, a large uh, uh, junk, uh, a large chunk of the drug, both liver and spleen, as you can see here. Um, the uh, the way to now to recognize this different um, uh, behavior of uh, the liposome products or even the nanoparticle products altogether uh, was summarized in this nice uh, slide by Su and Huang in a paper published already several years ago in which they classified the nanoparticles in four categories depending on the reticular endothelial system uptake and on the release rate of the of the drug from the from the nanoparticle and and in fact uh, we are mainly interested here in class 2 if we want to reach a, a tumor delivery at its best and this is a class of nanoparticles that show low reticular endothelial system uptake and slow release rate, thus guaranteeing 
that you have a high payload when you reach the tumor. This is the case of the doxyl liposomes, uh, the formulation that you well know, that you well know from, from clinical studies. I will not spend too much time on this slide, uh, but I think we all recognize that the liposomes are a versatile and well-established drug delivery technology. They don't have to be the only technology in this field of nanomedicine, and we hope that new carriers will also will also reach this uh, level of uh, uh, drug delivery um, characteristics that uh, enable us to come to regulatory ins uh, institutions, to regulatory um, uh, people, and try to bring up these things for clinical approval. Um, if we look at the, the past history of liposomes, well, we know that there are many that have already been clinically tested, but most importantly, there are about uh, right now about eight or nine that have been approved for clinical use, and they are shown in, in gray. You see the, the doxyl liposome, for which we already have at least um, three genetics uh, or approved by the FDA. We have the onivide, which is an irinotecan liposome. These are pegylated liposomes. We have non-pegylated liposomes, which are not doing so well, and we are not sure whether the marketing of these products will continue. We have liposomal vincristine, Marquibo, which substantially reduces the neurotoxicity of vincristine. A very interesting product, which is a co-encapsulated drug marketed by, by Jazz Pharmaceuticals, which is called Vixeos, in which liposomes contain RSC and downorubicin at a specific uh, drug ratio, and which has been approved for the treatment of AML in elderly people. And then there are more other, other products less used, one for regional therapy, and another one which is a non-cytotoxic macrophage activator. Um, this is the doxyl formulation, just a quick slide. We were involved in the development of this formulation. And, and basically, one key point in the development was the pharmacokinetic study in 1994, which showed that in, in 15 patients receiving uh, free doxorubicin, as you see in the red line, and then three weeks later, doxyl at the same dose, there was an unprecedented change in the, in the clearance of the drug with a 1,000-fold increase in the AUC, clearly a substantial difference shown very clearly in the same patient population, one by one comparison, and therefore indicating that we should probably expect, and indeed this was the case, significant pharmacodynamic changes. Um, in the next slide, just to show you a clear pharmacodynamic change, and this is a paper published by Dr. Peter Rose from Cleveland Clinic and his group not long ago, in which a patient uh, with ovarian cancer received 4,600 milligrams per meter square cumulative dose of doxorubicin in, in doxyl form. These are 115 cycles of pegylated liposomal doxorubicin along nine years with stable disease and no cardiac toxicity. This is more than 10 times the maximal recommended dose of, of cumulative re recommended dose of free doxorubicin, which shows clearly that we have real, really, uh, practically we have transformed, uh, we have caused a total metamorphosis of the drug by uh, incorporating it in, in an, a stable and long circulating nanomedicine. But the, the topic I wanted to, to dwell in today is, is about Promethil. And, and here we copying and, and, and after, you know, from the inspiration given by Doxil, we design a product in which we have a, a liposome with the same liposome characteristics. It is a pegylated liposome of the same composition as, as Doxil, but we actually uh, uh, synthesized a product of mitomycin C, which is extremely lipophilic and that, and that is tailored at perfection for, for incorporation in the bilayer of these liposomes. And so we try to exploit again the EPR effect for, for delivery of this product of mitomycin C to tumors. This product was developed together with Dr. Zalipsky, who was then at Alza Corporation. And it includes mitomycin C, of course, which is the active moiety. It includes a linker, which is a dithiobenzyl uh, linker spacer, which can be thiolytically cleaved 
to release the, the drug. And then it also includes two long aliphatic acid acyl chains, which give the characteristic lipophilicity to the product. So uh, we have shown very clearly that we using using reducing agents, either cysteine or N-acetylcysteine or DTT or many other free thiols, we can actually uh, uh, cleave the product and release release active mitomycin C plus some non-toxic byproducts. And, uh, and we have shown uh, clearly that this can be kinetically evaluated in an in vitro drug release assay using DTT, which is a classical reducing agent. It can be done by modifying the concentration of DTT, sorry, the concentration of DTT, or by modifying the type of exposure. And you will see that MLP transforms into mitomycin C in your HPLC. And, and pharmacologically speaking, we have shown very clearly this effect of activation uh, by in, in in vitro assays in which we use PLMLP is the is the the abbreviation for for promethyl uh, pegylated liposomal mitomycin C lipidic product and when we add DTT to the culture you can see that we can get a 100 fold increase of cytotoxicity uh, and on the other hand DTT does not change whatsoever the cytotoxicity of free mitomycin C so this product, this product, by the way, Promethil is very stable in plasma. Even for 24 hours, there is no mitomycin C appearing in the HPLC. So it, the, the drug is protected. The product is protected during circulation in plasma. But we know that tissues can activate very nicely this, this uh, product from the Promethil liposomes. And by doing an ex vivo assay of product cleavage, we have shown that a number of of mouse tissues, and we have recently also data from human tissues, will activate uh, and cause cleavage of MLP and release of mitomycin C. This is seen in normal tissues, uh, in, in a normal mice, and also in, in tumor tissue. So we, we know that the drug is can become bioavailable once it is delivered into tissues. And this is probably because there are many reducing uh, systems in tissues, mainly intracellular reducing systems that can actively uh, uh, activate the product. Pharmacokinetically speaking, we have shown that this is true across uh, many species that we have in mice, in rats, in mini pigs. We have a long circulating time and that, uh, um, and that if we compare the carrier, and, and that is an interesting question, do we have regulatory wise to ask uh, uh, for drug developers of nanomedicines to do to perform pharmacokinetics of the carrier as well as of the active ingredient. Well, in the case we do both, we see that there is there is some discrepancy. Okay, about we know that about 30% of the product is lost sometime along the the, circu the, the circulation time, uh, and the product the the, clean, the carrier is still there, but there is gradually a little bit less of product in circulation um, along the, the hours. So um, uh, these are more data in animals. I will, uh, these are in vivo data that shows also that in vivo we also, there is, there is significant um, cleavage of product. And clearly this is because of that, we, when we measure the product in tumor, we see much less than liposomal radio label because just the product is, is cleaved very quickly. And then mitomycin C is very difficult to measure due to its extremely fast and avid binding to DNA. We have shown in many tumor models that this formulation is superior, not only to, to mitomycin C, as you can see here, mitomycin C is in blue, promethyl is in red, but it is also more active than also co all the other comparators, such as cisplatin in this human model of cervix cancer, you can see here in in uh, uh, for all uh, for the average of the mice, and you can see individual curves in which you can also see better response in in blue for the for the promethyl than for cisplatin, and also here in other models in a gastric cancer sorry in a, in pancreatic models and gastric cancer models, uh, uh, you know doing better work than gemcitabine and and camptotesin also known as irinotecan so uh, one last uh, 
uh, uh, slide of a pro drug of preclinical studies. In, in we know that in MDR tumors, mitomycin C can still be active um, against some pig glycoprotein expressing tumors. And here we have a model in which, as you see here, Promethil is beating doxils uh, very clearly and also other drugs. This is a, a, a highly resistant ovarian cancer tumor model. Another area uh, of uh, interest is combination therapy. We have done combination studies in animals of Promethil with Paclitaxel. As you see here, again, very, very nice results with combining Promethil with Paclitaxel, better than giving single agent. And because Promethil is tolerated very well with very good safety profile. The same is when we combine with Doxil. Again, very almost we have experiments in which we can get actually practically nearly 100% cure rates when we do these combinations with a good safety profile. And, and another thing that we have been investigating recently is combining with anti-PD-1 with immunotherapy. And it seems this is a suggestive study. We haven't done uh, more than one study yet on this in this area. And it seems that Promethil can work well with anti-PD-1, as you can see here, uh, the result is better when you add anti-PD-1 to Promethil, and when you give Promethil or uh, anti-PD-1 alone, you don't see any effect. One last important thing in this field is the chemoradiotherapy. And as you may know, mitomycin C is a great radiosensitizing agent. But recently, we found in collaboration with Dr. Andrew Wang from University of Northern Carolina, that if you irradiate tissues those tissues they release because of the of the cellular damage they reduce they reduce uh, they release sorry free thiol groups and actually what you get is a more intense activation of the product if you combine radiotherapy with promethil so we think that this is a very interesting and attractive mode of application because on the one hand the mitomycin c active metabolite is causing a significant uh, radio sensitization. On the other hand, the damage caused by radiation is accelerating the product cleavage and the release of more mitomycin C. And we have clinical studies going on in, the, in this direction. The product has already been used in several clinical studies. It, has, it is a very robust product with a 60-month stability. And, uh, and we have done several studies, phase 1A, two phase 1Bs, and, and we are, have studies under planning in GI malignancies and also with radiotherapy in locally advanced pancreatic cancer. By now, we have already treated 145 patients, and we hope next year to start uh, more studies that will uh, give a, a more clear-cut indication uh, to, this, uh, to this product. I will, uh, this is the pharmacokinetics in humans, which not surprisingly is very similar as in as in, as in animals, we have a long T half, shorter than doxyl. It's one day in humans. For doxyl, it's between two to three days. Uh, and there is no detectable free and mitomycin C in plasma. And, uh, and altogether, the, the, the safety profile in humans was also pretty good. We have an MTD, which is threefold greater than the equivalent dose of mitomycin C. And we have observed anti-tumor anti activity. Uh, one of the, the recent results that we have observed in colorectal cancer patients are also quite encouraging because we see that almost about 30% of the patients can reach uh, around 30% plus minus can reach sta stable disease. And those patients that reach stable disease have a very good median survival of, in this case, 14 months. And for those who have progressive disease, you can see that they have a much shorter um, um, a much shorter survival. Uh, we have not yet seen in this difficult population of patients with very chemoresistant tumors, uh, objective response of shrinkage, but the differences in survival, they do suggest that we do have activity that contains the tumor growth and that is probably related to the promethyl administration. Another interesting observation we did in this phase 1b studies with colorectal cancer patients is the, the, the fact that we find that uh, stable disease patients have a longer half-life by about six hours, the, the, the 26 hours 
for stable disease as opposed to 20 hours for progressive disease. So there seems to be something about having a long circulation time is good for obtaining a stable disease. But of course, we don't know what comes first, whether the egg of the hen or the hen, because it could well very well be that it is the fact that the patients are, are prone to, 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 uh, to respond well to the drug and to remain stable given their better condition that maybe provides us with a, with a slower clearance. So we are investigating this, but altogether we find uh, the significant correlations. Here again, you have other correlations of uh, parapharmacokinetic parameters with survival, longer half-life, greater AUC, shorter, slower clearance are actually correlate with better survival. And in fact, all 12 patients in our group with THEF uh, above 20 hours survive for more than 20, 12 months. So, so those are uh, results that indicate that maybe there are some correlations here that we can exploit to be more selective in, in our patient populations. Uh, uh, these are other studies that we, in which we found that when patients have uh, high CA levels or very high levels, very, very high numbers of neutrophils in peripheral blood, they actually, they actually clear faster uh, the drug. And so maybe these patients are probably less um, amenable to treatment or to response by promethine. So those are our conclusions, which I already mentioned more or less. And we are pursuing other studies, as I said before, um, with uh, Promethil, uh, mainly with radiotherapy, but also in combination with other chemotherapies, given the preclinical data that shows highly uh, synergistic effects with various uh, anti-tumor agents. Uh, just to leave you a nice picture, this is a chemoradiotherapy patient in which you can see uh, the patient has a tumor here uh, uh, near the liver in the abdomen, and he received chemoradiotherapy with Promethil, and, and he responded beautifully. And as you see here, even 20 months, 22 months later, he is actually in complete response to the PET imaging, shows no uptake whatsoever in the lymph node mass that uh, was present there um, uh, when, we, when we gave the treatment. So um, if I have a few minutes left, I would like to switch gears and to talk to you about a little bit about a uh, rationale for drug co-encapsulation and liposomes. This has to do with a new project and uh, uh, that we are, uh, um, we are now advancing in our laboratory and also in collaboration with a newly founded company called Levco Pharmaceuticals. Uh, co-encapsulation is a very attractive way that uh, we can, in which we can perhaps exploit better the advantages of nanomedicine. It is really the co-delivery in space and time to target uh, of two uh, to target uh, two drugs uh, to uh, two therapeutic agents to achieve improved efficacy, and uh, we are looking for a synergistic effect at specific ratios, as I mentioned already, for the Vixios formulation, with no overlapping toxicities. Uh, Co-encapsulation facilitates uh, drug loading and uh, uh, sometimes, and this is a great advantage, I will show you one example in which we found that one drug helps us to load the second drug. And maybe if it helps you to prevent drug release uh, and stabilize the, the agents, well, even better. You actually have to go always back to, the, to this uh, subline, subheadline here. Liposome A plus B have to be compared to liposome A plus liposome B. Your aim is really to do better than when, than when you give two drugs in one liposome than, than giving each drug in a separate liposome. And, and there are other age advantages that can all were very simple advantages that can also be very positive for co-encapsulation. For instance, maybe if you want to give liposome A plus liposome B, the lipid mass, the particle mass that you have to give is very high. And by giving all both drugs in one single liposome, this could be much more tolerable for the patients. So even this simple effect can give you a justification to go for co-encapsulation. In our case, we have chosen amino bisphosphonates, and particularly we have chosen an amino bisphosphonate called alendronate, um, uh, together with doxorubicin for co-encapsulation. These, they have different mechanisms of action. They have non-overlapping 
toxicities and amino bisphosphonates have very interesting immunological anti-tumor effects by activating gamma delta T lymphocytes. So we are, uh, we are actually uh, one of the main things that we helped us to design this formulation was the fact that the bisphosphonate ammonium salts uh, can enable remote doxorubicin loading. And as shown here in the next slide, what we actually do, we actually work uh, more or less along the side the doxyl protocol, but instead of using an ammonium sulfate salt in which you use an inert salt, we use a, a, a salt of alendronate, an ammonium salt of alendronate, which is actually also by itself a, a, an active pharmaceutical ingredient. And the alendronate creates a gradient that allows us to incorporate doxorubicin by remote loading in a very stable form. And this formulation, uh, actually, this is the way by they look the liposomes before encapsulation of doxorubicin and after encapsulation of doxorubicin. You can see the roads which due to the precipitation of the alendronate of doxorubicin salt, they look pretty similar to the doxyl roads, but the only thing is that our liposomes tend to be uh, more round and the liposome, doxyl liposomes are more oval-like. And this has to do probably with the fact that the roads of doxyl grow a lot and by themselves they push the, the, the liposome and they elongate the liposome, creating these, these funny shapes. We have found that actually PLAD is a more potent activator of the inflammasome pathway than, than uh, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, we, leading to a 40-fold greater secretion of IL-1B and other cytokines. Those studies were done at the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab of the NCI. And we have also found greater therapeutic efficacy of our PLAT formulation over doxyl in immunocompetent mouse tumor models which uh, this is one, just one example. This is in the 41 breast cancer Balsi tumor model in which we have shown that PLAD is definitely more effective than, than doxyl, than PLD uh, in, in controlling tumor growth. So we are very enthusiastic about this, this uh, uh, avenue. And, and this is just a slide to show how that we really have a complex, always a complex uh, uh, here, uh, scheme to, to work through. We have to remember the tumor environment. We have to remember that sometimes we cannot achieve a, 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 we have to do a drug comparator that is viable and, and suitable to predict what is going to happen in clinical studies. And I think we also have to think about uh, things that like uh, doing a com uh, concomitant imaging to see whether our drug carrier or pharmacokinetics or of our drug carrier to see whether we are doing well, whether we are delivering to the cancer as we expect with our with our tumor, with our carrier, sorry, with our product. And just to to finish, to leave some time for questions, if there is time for questions. And this is my team at the Charette Sedek Medical Center. And uh, uh, the names are here. And uh, to save time, I will not go through this through all, through all the names. You can see them here. Uh, you can see also the names of the collaborators, Irene Labeck from Texas, Andrew Wang from University of Northern Carolina, Dr. Zalewski from San Francisco, Dr. Franco Mucha, uh, Dr. Marina Dobrovolskaya, uh, John Maher and uh, Rafa Rosales from, uh, from England, Thomas Andresen from Copenhagen, and Dr. Professor Barnholtz from Jerusalem. And of course, the liposome community, we are actually working along with, with uh, many ideas floating in this virtual background. And hopefully, we will get uh, uh, further along in the coming years. I would like, again, to thank uh, Beat for making this extraordinary effort and turning this meeting, which is really always uh, such a great experience, a personal experience, but doing uh, you know, what can be done to make sure we, we still have some presentations, even in this virtual background. So thank you, Beat, for keeping this meeting alive. And thank you to all of you for your attention. That was a, that was a fantastic start to the session. Thank you for that. Um, we don't actually have any questions on the system at the moment. So I think what we'll do is we'll save the questions for our discussion uh, session later, if that's OK with you. Um, and can I? Please encourage everybody that's listening, if you do have any questions, please do 
um, let us know those questions through the online system and we uh, we look forward to having a, a, a more detailed discussion um, later in the session. So I'll move on to our next speaker, which is Neil Littrott, good colleague of mine, who's going to talk to us about concentration dependent and concentration independent safety and biocompatibility considerations for nanomedicines. So I'll pass over to you, Neil, if you can unmute yourself. Thanks, Andrew. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, and I'm showing the right screen. It's always a, it's always a challenge. Um, so I won't read out the title again that Andrew's just introduced, but what I'd like to try and do is give you um, a couple of examples relating to concentration and concentration independent um, impacts on safety and compatibility that we've got uh, from the University of Liverpool. So my group's very interested in the interaction of nanoparticles with the immune and hematological systems. We do that for two reasons. Obviously, there's preclinical evaluation of new materials, but also we're very interested in the fundamental mechanisms of those interactions. Uh, and what I want to try and do is give you a few examples of um, some of the things that we've had to look at with respect to exposure response relationships for um, a few of the different materials that have been developed at Liverpool, but also um, other materials that we've worked on at the same time that weren't developed uh, within the University of Liverpool. So the first example I'd like to uh, talk you through a little bit is around these lapinavir solid drug nanoparticles. So Andrew briefly mentioned some of the reasons, you know, why one would develop uh, nanotechnologies for different therapeutics. This is not necessarily specific for HIV. The, 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 the principles of apply for uh, lots of different therapeutic indications. And Alberto has gone on you know, with respect to, to onco oncology applications. But for HIV, uh, you know, you've got insolubility of the actual drugs themselves. Some of them have low bioavailability and they have high dose requirements because the treatment of HIV is really complex and it involves a lot of different uh, medicines taken at different times. It's a relatively high pill burden. And again, as Andrew mentioned sort of in the introductory talk, uh, there's quite significant inter-individual variability in, in the response and the pharmacokinetics of, uh, of patients with HIV who are taking these drugs. So a few years ago now, um, developed at the University of Liverpool with these uh, antiretroviral solid drug nanoparticle uh, platforms. One was for an antiretroviral known as a Favarin's, the other was known for, was an antiretroviral development formulation for lupinavir. Um, that went through pharmacological and chemical evaluation and eventually uh, went through sort of a safety and biocompatibility assessment, um, which was you know, published uh, you know, quite a few years ago now. Um, what we were interested in was is the fact that we know a number of the protease inhibitors that are used to treat HIV, of which lapinavir is one. Uh, although they've been very successful in treating the virus and increasing the lifespan and, and health of, of patients who receive them, uh, we do know that they can be the benefits of them can be compromised by some serious side effects, not just limited to like dystrophy and hepatotoxicity, but there are some side effects that are associated with them. And the reason for that is that there's been a number of studies that have previously shown that they can cause um, endoplasmic reticulum stress, they can induce the unfolded protein response, um, and they can generally sort of uh, in, uh, create an imbalance in sort of stress mechanisms within the cells within which they accumulate. So what we actually wanted to do initially is we wanted to make sure that if we were making nanoparticle formulations of these drugs, whether or not we were um, causing any issues, if we were going to alter the accumulation or hopefully increase the accumulation within the cells that we were interested in. So I won't go through everything, uh, but just pick out some examples with respect to some of the cellular health assays that we ran. We looked at oxidative stress. We looked at caspase activation, mitochondrial membrane polarization. And initially, although we were doing it in primary human immune cells as well, uh, we started off in cell lines. So we used uh, CM cells, which is representative of the T cell line and the THP ones, which is a human monocytic cell line, which I think most people are probably quite familiar with. So this work was conducted by Dr. Chris David, who is part of the team. Um, and what we have here is uh, on the left of these graphs is always is the data in the CEMs in the T cell line. And on the right is the data within the THP1 cells. And what we've got on the first slide is, is um, reactive oxygen species. So this is total reactive oxygen species that are present within the cells after exposure. Uh, the uh, cells on their own treated with lapinavir 
trapezoid with the lapinavirus, the solid drug nanoparticle, and then the positive control. And that's the, that's, that, that'll be the same um, uh, through the next few graphs. And what was interesting um, with respect to this data was we found that there were cell specific differences. So the lapinavir didn't do much in the T cells, but it did have an impact in the, uh, so the SDN did have an impact in the T cells. Whereas in the THP1 cells, the lapinavir and the nanoparticle platform, sorry, nanoparticle formulation did induce some oxidative stress, um, but there was significantly less with respect to the, the nanoparticle platform. So we thought that was, that was quite interesting. Um, when we looked at caspase activation, so this is polycaspase activation, we look at caspase 3 and 7 and caspase 1 when we move through into uh, various um, specific mechanisms that we're, that we're interested in. What we found was that in the T cells, the lapinavir um, significantly induced caspase activation. And we actually uh, we were investigating which caspase that actually was, but the lapinavir nanoparticle formulation didn't, and we didn't see any difference or any significant difference between that and the untreated cells. So that was interesting. The second part that was also interesting was the fact that in the monocytic cell line, there wasn't any significant effect at all. So this was quite important for us because not only were we seeing a different difference between the free drug and the, the nanoparticle formulation, there was also cell or cell type specific differences. We saw differences between the T cell and the monocytic cell line. And just to finish that data off, we also looked at mitochondrial membrane depolarization, which is a, a very good measure of sort of general cell health, if you like. Um, and what we found was, again, in the T cells, the, nano, the, the free drug had much more of an impact. It caused um, significantly more mitochondrial membrane depolarization and the actual nanoparticle formulation of lupinavir didn't. So we didn't see any effect there of the, of the nanoparticles in in the T cells, uh, and although not significant, both the lapinavir and the nanoparticle platform uh, did actually have some effect on mitochondrial membrane polarization in, in the monocytes as well. So that was interesting because we saw some differences between the free drug and the nanoparticle formulation of the drug, uh, and also there were some cell type specific differences. So that was interesting because it showed that we weren't always going to get the same effect with respect to health and safety of the, of the cells. Um, uh, and it was very much cell type dependent. What was interesting, though, even though we did see caspase active or polycaspase activation in the cells, uh, there wasn't any significant difference in the percentage of apoptotic cells that were treated by either the lapinavir on its own or with the lapinavir nanoformulation. So which mechanisms are being activated, we're not 100 percent sure. We were following this up with caspase three and seven activation because obviously there was some apoptosis activation with the drugs. So we're following that up, but also whether or not there was um, maybe caspase one activation linked to oxidative stress and linked to inflammasome activation. So we're, we're in the process of following that up now. Um, when we sort of started to pull this apart and think, well, why, why might that be the case? Obviously, the first question we asked ourselves was, is it because there just isn't as much of the nanoparticle formulated or the nanoformulated lapinavir getting into the cells? And so other researchers within um, within the team, they looked at the accumulation of both the, the free drug and the nanoparticle formulation of the, of the lapinavir and uh, did some comparisons in a number of different cell types. There's just a summary of some of the cell lines that were ran at the time. And what was particularly interesting was that in the, mo the cell models that we'd use to do the cell health assessment, if anything, there was slightly more accumulation or slightly higher levels of the, of the drug present um, in the cells exposed to the nanoformulation rather than the free drug. So we know it's not just a direct, li a direct link to concentration dependent effects. Why might that be the case? Well, as Andrew alluded to before, obviously free, um, the unformulated drugs and the nanoparticles accumulate in cells in different way. Why that might be, well, that's obviously linked to size. So if we come to this example of the transporters, that, um, the membrane transporters that a lot of um, therapeutics and um, endogenous molecules as well use to move across the cell membrane um, is roughly sort of 10 nanometers in size. And then if one is to consider sort of a nanoparticle as well, it's very unlikely that say in this example, a 100 nanometer or even a 50 nanometer nanoparticle um, will, be, will accumulate um, through those transporter-based mechanisms. Although, 
as as again Andrew mentioned previously, it's possible that the drugs themselves might might still come out of the formulation and accumulate through the, in the cells using those normal mechanisms. But we know uh, that most of those nanoparticle uptake systems are through endocytosis and phagocytosis. So it tends to suggest that maybe it's not just about the amount of drug that's making it into the cell, but it's its subcellular distribution, its subcellular localization potentially within either the cytosol. Um, or, um, or, sub, or, or en endocytic vesicles or phagocytic vesicles that might sort of be, uh, be linked to some of those effects. And we repeated this in primary cells as well. So this is in uh, primary CD4 T cells from um, healthy volunteers and uh, primary monocytes from healthy volunteers. And we saw very similar effects with respect to oxidative stress um, caused by the lipinavir and the formulation. And again, differences between uh, the formulation and the free drug and also differences um, between the, the two cell types. There wasn't as much induction of oxidative stress there. And if we move through into the mitochondrial membrane depolarization, what was interesting from this work was that we actually saw uh, there was roughly the same amount of depolarization between the lipinavir and the lipinavir SDM. And we're trying to work out what the differences might be uh, with respect to the cell line models and, um, and the primary cells and what the implications of that might be. As well as the, the concentration or maybe the subcellular localization effects, we obviously have to consider exposure time. Um, so this is some work that uh, we've been conducting within the team on autophagy. I think autophagy itself doesn't need much of an introduction. You know, it's part of the normal homeostasis of the cells, which is involved in removing dead or you know, damaged organelles from the cells and, and replacing them to produce um, so that new, new versions can be replicated. It's important in infections and in immunological responses as well. Uh, we know that some viruses have are involved with uh, use autophagy as part of their life cycle. And also we know that some immunological responses, in particular inflammasomes, can be regulated through autophagic processes. And we're, we're interested in, in those kind of processes. Within the field, we know that nanoparticles have previously, and lots of different types of nanoparticles, have been shown to affect autophagic processes, whether that's inhibition of autophagic flux or increase in autophagic flux or it, disruption of autoph uh, autophagosomes, this kind of thing. There's lots of examples out there in the literature as to why that might be the case. So what we did is we assessed a, a broad panel of nanoparticle types, different size, charges, classes, inorganics, uh, polymeric, um, uh, polystyrene as well, lots of different nanoparticles in a system that uh, we optimized where we measured autophagy flux. And we did that in a number of different cell lines. So again, CEMs, T cells, RADGES, which are a B cell like line and THP1s, which are a, a monocytic cell line. And so this is, uh, this paper is currently under review at the moment. And what we found was, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, the, there was a, 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 a maybe a weak but a significant relationship between uh, the size of the particles and the impact on autophagy. So basically anything, the further down on the y-axis that we see these results, the, the greater the impact on autophagy. So there's a relationship there. But one of the things that we found when we were optimizing this assay and running the particles and, and controls through it was that there were very, very important time-dependent effects. And those time-dependent effects were also specific to particular cell types. So in these graphs, uh, we measured fluorescence, which was associated with autophagosome, um, autophagosome levels within the cells. We did it in, again, the three, the three different cell lines that are present on the, on the slide. And what we found was that the time of exposure was significantly related to the impact on autophagy that we saw. So in this example, we saw the greatest impact on autophagy with the small molecule controls that we would expect in the THP1s at 24 hours. Uh, whereas within the CEMs, it was eight hours. And in the RADGES, we actually saw that at six hours. So the exposure time was particularly important as well. And we know that there were difference between um, the accumulation of the small molecules and the accumulation of nanoparticles. You know, that there are time dependent effects because obviously they're, they're being taken up by different mechanisms. Um, so we know that there are obviously time dependent effects there. So that's another consideration that we and probably others have found when we look at these exposure response relationships is what time point that we should conduct these assays at. And it's very important to optimize those and get a better idea of what the actual exposure is uh, of the, with the different particle platforms. Um, 
Following on from uh, the time dependence effect there, obviously we're, we've also considered long-term or chronic exposure to these materials, not just from an environmental perspective, but also from the idea of the development of long-acting therapeutics. And there's a number of benefits there because you can have the release of those therapies over a longer period of time. So that might, especially in the case of HIV, allow for forgiveness in the therapies, maybe missed doses. So you can maintain the appropriate form of kinetic parameters that you need for your particular indication. There's also a possible use in prophylaxis, you know, for healthcare workers and something particularly important in the current situation with COVID-19. Usually it tends to be an implant or a depot injection in the subcutaneous region of the skin. Um, and what we're very interested in is what happens within that injection site or that administration site to the cells that surround it. Are they activated? Are they inhibited? Is it toxic? Um, and uh, particularly input interest in subtoxic effects and so not just general cell death, how the exposure or long-term exposure of those cells to these materials might affect their health and their function. So what we've been doing um, over the past year or so is we've been conducting some repeat exposure assays um, in a number of immunologically relevant cell lines. Again, I've sort of listed them on the on the slide. Um, they try and um, model or mimic the administration site and the cells that are present. Um, we've been doing that for at least a couple of months now. So we've been doing it for around eight weeks uh, with respect to exposure of the CEMs, T cells, THP1s, KU812s are a basophilic cell line, MUTs3 are a, uh, sort of a dendritic cell-like cell line. And we've been doing that alone and in combination using hydrogel and 3D uh, cultures to mimic the subcutaneous administration site and see how the cells behave. Um, and then all what we've been doing is some measures of um, phenotype and function, but also measures of cellular health with respect to oxidative stress and, and some of the things that I mentioned previously. So this work has been conducted by uh, Daniel Brain, who's a, a PhD student in the group. Uh, and this is just to show you some data with some of the antiretrovirals themselves that we've seen and the impacts that they have on some of the cells that we've been in investigating. So this is in the KU812 cells, which are basophilic cells. They were exposed to the drugs uh, and some particles as well um, for a period of eight weeks. And then we assessed um, some of the measures of cell health. And hopefully what you can see on this slide is that with respect to measurements of mitochondrial membrane polarization, the drugs had a significant impact on that. So they, similar to some of the other antiretrovirals, there was an impact on uh, mitochondrial, the, the mitochondrial membrane was depolarized, which we kind of expected. What we found when we measure that again in the absence of the drug, so even though they've been exposed for eight weeks and then we remove the drug and keep the culture, the membrane polarization tends to revert back to normal. So that's not particularly unexpected. What was interesting though, is when we measured um, levels of reactive oxygen species and subsequent uh, measures of glutathione content to look at um, possible um, oxidative stress was that this was the data that was generated after eight week exposure. But then when we did remove the drugs and the particles and measured them again in the absence, um, the levels were still particularly high. So it did suggest that there was some other um, things going on in the cell after uh, sort of long-term exposure to some of these drugs and particles. As well as uh, measures of cellular health in, the, in these K812 cells, we also looked at where, how they would respond uh, to um, known stimulants and looked at markers of activation. So what we did is we did flow cytometry looking at CD63, CD203C and CD164. Uh, the KU812s, which are um, involved in sort of basophil activation. And what we've got on each of the slide, on each of the graphs is um, the untreated cells, the cells treated with um, a couple of different stimulants, and then we have um, the cells treated with just the drug and then the drug plus the stimulants to see whether or not the drugs had any effect and whether or not the drugs affected their response to uh, particular stimulants. So I don't have time to go every, through every single data point. But what we did find that was quite interesting was with respect to CD63, um, the, res the, the levels of expression of that marker was particularly low in the cells that have been um, exposed uh, to, the, to the drugs and the particles for a long period of time. And also their response to the stimulants wasn't quite as marked as in the, in the untreated cells. The inverse was kind of shown for CD164. What we found was that levels of the levels of expression in the cells were a lot higher in cells that have been exposed to the drug. And also we didn't have as much of an impact um, on expression because levels were quite high of the actual stimulants. So we're trying to follow that up now to try and work out why the cells might be slightly different uh, in their responses after long-term exposure. 
Uh, and one of the mechanisms that we use to follow that up is that we think that there might be, because uh, stress and activation in the cells have been ongoing for a couple of months, they might have changed their phenotype and their bioenergetic profile to, to reach that. So we looked at uptake of glucose into those cells using 2-deoxyglucose as a, as, a, um, as a surrogate for glucose uptake. And what we found was that within the KU812s that are expe exposed to the drugs in the cells, glucose uptake was much lower. And what we found, we know, and I don't have time to show you the data, is we know that um, long-term exposure to these things changes the expression of those glucose uptake transporters so that they, they're not quite as responsive um, to, the, to the stimulants that we would normally expect them to be. And we're following that up now with some sort of, uh, with some um, more in-depth metabolomic profiling. So in summary, we have to take into account the real exposure of the materials, not just the concentration. Um, Definitely from our data, the effects that we see in one cell type might not be completely uniformly replicated across different cell types. So the, the critical path of the project and the material is important in the cell choice. The exposure times, multiple time points is really important to see where most of the effect actually occurs. And we know that long-term exposure to some of these things might alter some of their metabolic pathways and change how the cells respond. Uh, so I'll leave that there. Um, thanks very much for your time. This is just to, to thank everyone in the group and everyone in the various departments who've been involved in this work, and particularly important, the volunteers who continue to donate, donate their blood. They're really important. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do anything. Uh, and that's it for me. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Neil. Um, we'll, we'll leave the questions until later again, Neil, if that's OK. Um, so we'll uh, move on to our next presenter, um, who's Professor Ryan Donnelly from uh, Queen's University Belfast. It's great to have you with us, Ryan. Um, Ryan's going to talk to us about nanoparticle loaded microarray patches to extend pharmacokinetic exposure. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks very much, Andrew. I wonder, can anybody see my screen? Because I can't see it at the moment for some reason. No, that's okay. It's maybe just uh, a bit slow. Let's try that again. Okay. It's the joys of online conferencing, right? Yeah, this is it. Um, okay, let's try this. Hmm. I think you're at the end of the slideshow. Yeah, but you know, even whenever I I went into it, yeah, well, okay, well let let's let's go back to the start, and and see if that um if that does it. So apologies for this. Let's see if I can get it sorted out. All right. That's better now, yeah? Yeah, that works. Thanks, Ryan. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. So, um, as Andrew said, I'm going to talk to you about how loading nanoparticles, particularly nano suspensions, but even micro suspensions, into what we call microarray patches can potentially extend pharmacokinetic exposure and replace um, intramuscular injections of long acting medicines. So, Microarray patches or, or microneedle arrays, as the name suggests, are arrays of tiny microstructures on a solid base. And they can be made from all sorts of different materials, polymer, glass, metal, um, elemental silicon. What they all tend to have in common is that they tend to be quite small patches, so one or two square centimeters, and the individual needles tend to be um, quite short in and around about um, one millimeter or less. So they painlessly and without drawing blood penetrate the skin stratum corneum barrier and allow us to deliver medicines into and across the skin. They've typically been used though for small doses of pretty potent water soluble molecules like vaccines or insulin, where a small patch can deliver a therapeutic dose. And it's very rare that thought has been given to delivery of high doses or delivery of poorly soluble molecules in particulate format. But I think that there are some indications for that developing. 
And what we might think is, at the moment, long-acting antiretroviral drugs, such as those that, that Andrew and Neil mentioned, are typically given by intramuscular injection in a fairly high dose of a few hundred milligrams, and they will, um, over a period of weeks or months, release the active drug, and that will be absorbed by the, the microcirculation and will um, have a therapeutic impact then in the body. So we can deliver two drugs for treatment of HIV in this way. We can deliver one drug um, for prevention in high-risk individuals. But what that is associated with is the use of hypodermic needles. Um, so this is, can cause needle stick injuries. It's associated with the use of um, healthcare professionals and people having to actually go to a healthcare setting. Now, in the current circumstances, we want to keep people away from healthcare settings if at all possible to avoid spread of COVID-19. And ideally, we would want to have um, the capacity to administer um, the medicines in people's own homes. And this can be really important in developing countries in particular, where people might have to walk for two days to get to a healthcare setting. We also have problems with needle stick injuries leading to transmission of disease um, and problems with people who don't just don't like getting injections. So about 20% of people are needle phobic. We do have the ability to have um, sustained drug delivery. Um, and if you can administer several drugs, then you can have treatment, as I said, as well as prophylaxis. Um, what we need to consider though is that any technique we use will have to be used regularly by patients. Um, so these injections may be given once a month or, or once every two months. So this is something that people must come back to get. Well, we need to think then if, if we're going to um, deliver these drugs systemically um, using, for example, a microneedle system, um, we need to consider that most of these long acting drugs aren't of high potency. And we need tens or hundreds of milligrams to actually have a therapeutic or preventative effect. Now, bear in mind that most microneedle patches were designed to deliver a few hundred micrograms. That clearly has implications for the patch size. And also then for patient application. So as the patch becomes bigger, will people actually be able to actually um, apply those patches? Another question is what happens if people repeatedly apply a microneedle patch to their skin, particularly if the polymer housing the nanoparticles has to dissolve in the skin and is therefore itself deposited in the viable skin layers? And that's a key question that needs to be answered. What happens when you repeatedly apply microneedles to the skin, as opposed to, you know, what might happen if you're only doing a once-off vaccination? We need to have a system that's cost competitive because pharma companies can produce injections in vast quantities relatively cheaply. So a microneedle patch has to at least be cost competitive. I think if we can address these questions, and, and I have good reason to believe we can, that there will be significant advantages for industry and, and a lot of benefit for patients. So how would we make a formulation like this? So what we would take would be our, our nano-formulated drugs, so typically made using top-down or bottom-up approaches to produce nano-crystals. And we would mix that with an aqueous polymeric gel and then cast that into a suitable mold to form the microneedles. And ideally, the, the drug will only be in the part of the needle that goes beneath the stratum corneum because these are hydrophobic nanoparticles and you're creating aqueous holes in the skin. So you're unlikely to deliver any drug that doesn't go beneath the stratum corneum. So you should dry the, the needles and then have a border adhesive and an occlusive back and layer to form the patch. And the base plate upon which the needles are formed should either dissolve on the surface of the skin or better still readily detach um, after a short wear time to leave the needles and their drug content beneath the stratum corneum. So we can then have sustained release. Um, now, whether the drug just dissolves from the particles and goes straight into the dermal microcirculation, or whether some of the smaller particles, and we have some evidence for this, less than 100 nanometers, end up moving by passive um, flow of um, skin interstitial fluid into the lymph nodes, um, or whether we end up be, um, with these particles, so, some of them being engulfed by cells, and that either leading to tracking to the lymph node or granuloma formation and sustained release. For the intradermal space, these questions haven't yet been answered. 
So the first example we looked at um, a few years ago was with Real Pivering in a project sponsored by USAID and, and led by the PATH organization. We took Janssen's Real Pivering nano suspension injection and mixed it with polyvinyl alcohol and polyvinyl pyrolidone to form microneedles, which we then applied to the skin of rats. And we compared the pharmacokinetics in the plasma over 56 days with those um, in the plasma um, when we had an intramuscular injection. And we also looked at vaginal tissue as well. And what we found that was by and large over the 56 days, we had similar levels in both plasma and vaginal tissue for both delivery systems. Now we've done a lot of work with Andrew's colleague on pharmacokinetic modeling, Marco Sicardi, who's a, a leading expert in this area. And at the moment, we are, are still in the infancy of really understanding the conversion from rat data um, to human data in terms of patch size, especially when flip-flop pharmacokinetics are operating and we're delivering the drug intradermally as opposed to intramuscularly. And instead of putting one big bolus in, like we would get if we, we gave an injection, and it formed either a, a sort of a, a mini beach ball or a long sort of sausage shape in the muscle, here we're putting in hundreds or thousands of tiny little boluses. And the implications of that on the, the allometric scaling um, from rats to humans is still not fully understood. At present, our best guess is that for seven days, human treatment or, or human plasma and vaginal tissue levels, we would need a patch of about 25 to 30 square centimeters. So akin to a normal size transdermal patch without micronutrients. Like Next example that we studied was etrovirine, where in this case, there was no um, nano suspension injection to compare. So what we wanted to do here was we wanted to just see, well, you know, is this sort of 200 to 300 nanometer nano suspension necessary to make these microneedles? Or can you just take the drug powder out of the bottle, mix them with the gel and actually form the microneedles and get similar pharmacokinetics? So this is what we did. We, we com compared just a simple intravenous injection of etrovirine um, in the rat with microneedles that were made with just the plain powder form of etrovirine or the nano suspension. And we didn't see any difference between the nano suspension and the, the powder form of the drug. And this could have implications in terms of the cost of manufacture, because clearly it's much cheaper to deal with just the nano or the, the powder rather than having to make the nano suspension. The next compound we looked at was cabotegravir. And we took either the, the long acting injection from our partners in Vive or the, just the free acid and um, powder, or the sodium salt of cabotegravir, which is more water soluble. We made the microneedles from that and we applied um, the microneedles to the skin of rats and then compared that to uh, an injection of 10 milligrams per rat, either intramuscularly or intradermally. And what we found was that after around about seven days, the, the free acid um, and the long acting um, injection um, formulation um, put into microneedle form um, was um, given quite good levels in that we were above four times the PAIC90. And that was true right up to 28 days for both of those. But when we used the sodium salt at day seven, we were actually comparable to the intramuscular and intradermal injections that had similar amounts of drugs. And thereafter, the plasma levels started to decay. And actually what we, we believe is happening here is that the microneedles obviously aren't delivering all of their drugs. Some of the drug is remaining above the stratum corneum as evidenced by a sort of a white residue on the surface of the skin. And we were estimating that the efficiency of delivery with the microneedles in this case was in and around about 15 to 20% of the drug loading. So a lot of our, our subsequent work and our work at the moment has been on improving um, the actual delivery efficiency. Again, the patch size for seven days would be somewhere between 20 and 30 square centimeters. Um, so this is seven days delivery um, for both rilpivirine and cabotegravir, we, we think, based on, on early allometric scaling. And this would replace the monthly intramuscular injections. Now in my time as a community pharmacist, dealing with patients who would take medicines um, on a weekly basis, and also who would get injections of, for example, anti-schizophrenic drugs, on a monthly basis, I think a person would remember to apply a patch, say, every Monday morning 
rather than applying a patch um, on the first day of every month. So I think weekly application can be very feasible. We then wanted to look at, at co-delivery of ropivirine and cabotegravir um, following a single application um, where we applied both patches to the rats and we followed the plasma levels over time and compared um, the density of the microneedles. So we had um, more microneedles on an array um, in one case and slightly less in, in another case. We compared this with intramuscular and intradermal injections. And for ropivirine, we basically found that the microneedles perform better um, over a 70 day period. Um, and you know, over that period, they were above the IC90 value for um, ropivirine. So they performed better than the injections. With cabotegravir, the, the overall exposure was less than for the injections, but again, we were getting um, quite good sustained release from a single patch application. And then we wanted to look at multiple applications. So we wanted to look at a scenario where the microneedles were applied repeatedly to essentially top up the excreted drug. Um, and we looked at this for ropivirine and cabotegravir in two different scenarios. So in cohort one, we did an intramuscular injection at the beginning to mimic maybe a patient coming to a HIV clinic once every six months and then being given a packet of, of six patches to apply over the, the remaining um, period and then coming back for another top up with intramuscular or just repeated microneedle patch applications. Um, and again, for ropivirine, um, we saw um, extremely um, close um, proximity of the data from day 14 onwards. For, for cabotegravir, there was more of a disparity at, at the beginning, but by the time we got to day 28, the, the data was, was actually getting quite close. So we do think that these formulations have promise. Um, and as I say, we're working on improving further the delivery efficiency at present, and also trying to understand you know, about the particles and where they go and how they behave when delivered intradermally. As I said, we already have some evidence that ropivirine particles and will end up um, to some extent in the lymphatic system. So I'm talking about large patches here and um, people have to be able to use these microneedles um, and I think ideally they'd be able to self-apply them. So we did a study where we got people to read a patient information leaflet and apply microneedles to their own skin. Now these were little one square centimeter patches. But what we found was when they followed this leaflet, when they were um, counseled by a pharmacist, they all inserted the microneedles to the same extent in the skin as we would as the so-called experts. What they all said was they wanted feedback and they wanted some way to know that they'd actually applied the patch properly to the skin. So we developed a little pressure responsive film that would change color if and only if 20 newtons per square centimeter had been applied when we knew 10 newtons per square centimeter would insert the microneedles. Again, small patches, but we had 20 volunteers again 75% of them preferred the patch that had the sensor film. And we saw that in all volunteers, they inserted the microneedles just as well as we would as measured with optical coherence tomography. So we wanted to look at a larger patch. And in this case, we used a patch that was made up of 16 individual microneedle patches. So about 16 to 20 square centimeters. They applied the microneedles to their own shoulder region. Um, and we measured the depth of insertion and the width of the pore created. And what we found was across all the volunteers, the depth of insertion and width of pore created were the same as if a one square centimeter patch was applied. So we think people can apply large patches, making this technology at least viable. As I said, in our development, um, we're now improving the efficiency of development. Some recent work has shown that we can improve delivery efficiency up to about 40% of the, the loaded drug. Now that won't make the patch size any smaller, but it'll certainly waste less drug. And we've shown that, that both mono and co-delivery is possible. But as I mentioned, we, we still have a lot of work to do in understanding pharmacokinetics of, of microneedle um, patches delivering long-acting HIV drugs. We do have a, have a program now that we, we are seeking funding for to de-risk the actual platforms themselves in accordance with regulatory advice. So show that the, the blank microneedles are safe and then develop a bridging program applicable to any drug that you would want to deliver. And that could be then something that you would hand to a pharma partner to aid with um, translation. 
In terms of manufacturing scale up, so LTS Lohmann in Germany now have Europe's only manufacturing license for GMP microneedles. And we work closely with LTS, so we think a, a product can be made. With our, our partners um, in PATH now, we would like to study some macaque studies and, and particularly um, to look at, at prevention and, and treatment and of HIV using these long acting patches. Hopefully then we can convince some of the pharma companies to come on board for clinical trials. And this will then in due course lead to commercialization and patient benefits. So before I finish, I'd just like to, to thank um, our sponsors and also the various um, members of our group. And you can see our new socially distant um, group picture here and um, where everybody has, has had their picture taken separately as opposed to the the big team photo that we usually would get. And also that to thank um, Andrew for the kind invitation and also to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Brilliant, Ryan, thank you very much. I'm very excited to see where this technology goes, as you know. Um, again, we'll, we'll save the questions until later, if that's okay. Um, and please audience, if you have any questions, please use the online system to uh, let us know what those questions are. So we'll move on to the next speaker, Professor Cameron Alexander from the University of Nottingham, who's going to tell us about using magic to widen the therapeutic window. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks very much. I hope everyone can see my screen there. Is that going to, on to full screen for everyone? Uh, it's not on full screen yet, Cameron. Okay, we there? Um, yes, thank you. Great. Well, well, thanks very much for the invitation. And uh, um, what I thought I'd do today, uh, I'll just switch on the uh, pointer option so I've got a laser pointer as well. Uh, I just want to go through some of the what we've been doing at, um, at Nottingham uh, in looking at uh, how we can use some polymer chemistries to uh, perhaps widen the therapeutic index of a range of different uh, uh, drug types. So I'll just walk you through this uh, particular uh, rationale initially. Uh, so obviously, I think we're well aware that there are many problems with current therapeutics for cancers, uh, and also very much so for infectious diseases. And although I'm going to talk about a cancer application today, many of the questions that I mentioned are also relevant for uh, antimicrobial delivery, uh, antivirals and vaccines, and we have programs in those uh, uh, ongoing. But the classic problems are, of course, the untargeted nature of many drugs and the uh, difficulties in dosing so that we stay in the therapeutic region and below the toxicity threshold and also above a state where we're not uh, engendering resistance. We're well aware that many um, drugs, despite the best efforts, I'm a chemist, best efforts of medicinal chemists, uh, many of these drugs don't have the right physical chemical properties, and that applies to small molecule drugs and, of course, to uh, macromolecular therapeutics. And, of course, it's very important that we uh, are aware that any delivery system that we use uh, has the ability to get that dosing right, so we don't then select for resistant phenotypes uh, and uh, allow mutations to develop. So we've been interested for a number of years in using uh, polymer nanotechnology. And our key goal has effectively been to try to protect the drug from the body and the body from the drug during transit. And we've put a lot of work into trying to work out ways in which we can carry drugs in particular um, formats and then designing some chemistries so we trigger release of that drug at a target site. And a particular interest is looking at uh, coupling to external stimuli. So that might be light, that might be ultrasound, uh, there may be a, a range of, of other uh, orthogonal techniques that one can use. We've also been looking at chemistries which will uh, change at a target site, perhaps to reveal ligands to promote specific cell internalization. But also, and I'm going to talk about this today, um, some functionalities which respond to intracellular and some extracellular conditions, which enable some level of control of vehicle trafficking. So the the carrier system itself and uh, and how um, those functionalities uh, can also uh, uh, modify or change the site of drug release. But I think we do need to be aware um, 
in all of this, and, and it's interesting that, that all the speakers in the session, I think, have, have mentioned this to some extent, that there are some paradoxes in when we look at delivery. Um, because when we're looking at, at things like cancers or um, viral diseases and so on, you know, we do have uh, complex disease mechanisms, multiple targets. I've already mentioned resistance. So, you know, we, we have complex diseases that we need to address. And we might need to use combination therapeutics. There may be different immune responses uh, to the materials that we use. Uh, and of course, there are different immune responses. And we're considering things like vaccines, clearly. Um, uh, a, a desired immune response is, is, is what we seek. But that means our systems can be rather complex. And that does set up a number of challenges. So we've been adopting two principal design strategies to address this, this um, complexity issue. So you can build complex machinery. So things that actually look a little bit like viruses uh, from the bottom up. So you can generate materials by quite simple uh, precursors, build them up in particular ways uh, until you get a, um, a nanoparticle, nanomaterial, and you can decorate these in a variety of different ways with known building blocks. And so you can essentially build quite complex function in the way that nature does from uh, readily available building blocks, but it may be those building blocks are limited. The other way of doing this is to generate the function in your, uh, your nanotechnology from entirely new materials. Um, so these might be synthetic components. So you, you get, if you like, the ultimate function that you want, uh, but then you know, consider the translational part and you think, well, which, which components can I rebuild with perhaps more accessible building blocks so that the overall material can be translated more easily? And that might be known, might be regarded as a top-down approach. What I would say, of course, is that we do need to have as much simplicity as possible because, you know, if we're going to translate anything, then we can't have anything which is too complicated, but we do need sufficient complexity to get our materials to function. Uh, anyone who's done any research for any length of time at all will know that even the most simple materials can give you quite unexpected results. And I think we have to be aware on this particular um, category, even in the current pandemic and so on, Who's, who's going to pay for this? How much can they pay? Can we afford uh, complex uh, medicines? So those are some of the issues that we face when we're designing uh, some of these uh, delivery systems and using or developing nanotechnologies. So I'm going to just give, just give one example today, uh, and uh, that's uh, a systemic drug delivery uh, for activity against triple negative breast cancers. And the reason why we've been interested in this is a particularly aggressive cancer and very poor prognosis and uh, very much so within particular patient groups. The current standard of care, surgery, radiation and cytotoxics, and these are rather suboptimal at the moment. Many of the drugs are associated with acute toxicities and also long term toxic side effects. So there's a real clinical need to improve um, uh, treatments for, for TNBC. There's also high relapse in TNBC patients. And this actually there may be one of the ways in which we, one can um, address this because there is uh, increasing evidence now that, uh, and this has been mentioned in previous other talks about changes in redox um, species. And it may be that some cancer stem cells in uh, triple negative breast cancers uh, have a change in the um, intracellular homeostasis uh, and materials and particularly peptides such as glutathione but also some enhanced proteinetic enzymes. And certainly um, when you're looking at patients who've had um, radiotherapy, there, there are a variety of changes which take place as a result of, of radiotherapy. So we've been interested in looking at how we can exploit some of the aberrant biology of polymer carriers. And the particular goals that we've been setting are to look at polymers which can be stable after systemic injection. Again, there are issues with systemic injection, but this is something that, that uh, most clinicians understand uh, rather well. So it's difficult to move away from, from some of those uh, standard treatments. But also polymers which can be stable, but release drugs following accumulation in tumors. So that's a classic drug delivery problem. So our goal particularly was to see whether we could design polymers from accepted building blocks, which allow high or multiple drug loading, 
good penetration in tissue and in situ release based on TNC biology, particularly the biology that may have changed following radiation. So changes in redox species, glutathione, um, maybe in actually increases in reactive oxygen species, um, reductions in glutathione S transferase, uh, and these changes in biology uh, may, may take place over different uh, timescales. So these were the goals we set ourselves. So I'm going to walk you through some of the uh, polymers that we've we've made to address this. And actually, this paper just came out um, uh, <coughs> at the end of last week. So uh, uh, you can see some of the data uh, actually now in, the, in this paper. And so we were starting out from uh, polymers made from uh, hydroxypropyl methacrylamide. And this is the, the monomer. And the reason we chose this is that this has been taken um, in the PK1, PK2 from Ruth Duncan, uh, Henry Kopacek and so on. Polymers made from this monomer have been taken to phase two and three. So there's a, a very large amount known about this material. But there are ways in which you can um, adapt it and modify it so that you can make materials with a range of different architectures and you can put in other different chemistries so you can load uh, drugs and so on. And so we had two main families of, of polymers uh, in our set. So we had some effectively non-degradable polymers and we made these in, in architectures such that we made uh, hyper-branched polyHPMA uh, and also uh, we made branches then we grew more HPMA from those branches. So these are hyper-branched polymers and star polymers. And the reason we made them in this way is that these can be made to a particular size. So we made these about between five, 12 nanometers and hyperbranched or stars. So that gives you control over the size. And we've already seen how that can be important in terms of transport. Uh, but also at uh, each of these points, we can carry uh, drugs off these side chains. So we can have quite high drug loading, but because of the shape and the overall solubility of these uh, outer chains, we can maintain these as uh, long circulating carriers. Our second component was to put in some chemistries which would allow for um, a reductive cleavage of these polymers at particular points. So the key thing here was to, <coughs> was to use a crosslinker with some components here which will break down uh, as a result of increased uh, reduction potential inside uh, these TNBC, the triple negative breast cancer cells. And of course, there's been a lot known about uh, disulfide linkers, so we, we wanted to make sure we we could use uh, what's already known from disulfide linkers and PHPMA polymers and combine them in a variety of ways to generate a, a series of probe materials. And we also had put in chemistry so that we can attach drugs at various points. So we can have uh, modifications of HPMA, so we can put in um, hydrozone linkers and a variety of other chemistries to affect uh, acid uh, cleavage mediated drug release. So we generated polymers non-degradable of this size and these architectures, and then a range of different polymers, another hyperbranch degradable system, then with a star here. So this is one was 10 nanometers, 15 nanometers, a, a linear polymer, which self-assembled into 30 nanometer particles. And then we made some micellar based systems around 60 nanometer particles. So all these polymers have essentially the same chemistry. They just have different architectures in them. But the key thing is also that these molecular models uh, show the uh, uh, rough conformations of these materials, they have the ability to break down into smaller units. And the idea here was that these could then penetrate better in uh, solid tumors following systemic in, uh, injection. But the key thing is they've all got the, the same fundamental chemistries, we've just got different architectures. So that allows us to probe the effects of size, shape, conformation on how these materials uh, transport and how they then release uh, their drugs. So just a bit of characterization data. These things show up quite nicely in, in TEM. Uh, and you can see they all look uh, reasonably spherical in TEM. That's because, of course, they're, they're dehydrated. And the sizes come out very, very nicely from uh, what we saw from light scattering. And you can see from the light scattering traces that we have uh, good distributions uh, apart from this micellar one, which uh, is slightly broader, as you might expect, but we can tune the particle size over a variety of um, 
uh, main peak heights. So we can tune the, the sizes in quite a range from um, several nanometers through to more than 100 nanometers. And we can do this, these are the degradable ones, these are the non-degradable ones. If we then um, add glutathione, uh, reducing species, we see these polymers, uh, the re reduction sensitive ones, uh, falling away and uh, degrading as we'd expect. All except for, for one of these, this micellar system where the um, disulfide is contained in the core and so therefore is less accessible to this to glutathione, which causes an um, uh, aqueous peptide. So aqueous soluble peptide. So what you can see is you can design in not just the initial particle size, but also the uh, size that eventually decay to, and that will uh, have some effects on how they behave uh, in vitro and in vivo. So let's have a look at how they distribute. And we did a, a whole set of experiments where we administered uh, degradable and non-degradable uh, polymers uh, to uh, healthy mice and also uh, tumor bearing mice. And what we did is we harvested the organs after particular times, one, four and 24 hours. And we looked at where these polymers ended up. So this is an end phase analysis. And you see some quite interesting patterns. So this is quite busy, I accept. So I'll, I'll, I'll walk uh, everyone through this. But uh, what you can see is on this side of the graph, we have um, relatively higher accumulation in the kidneys. So these polymers, hyperbranch non-degradable, hyperbranch non-degradable in the kidneys. In this case, there was a hyperbranched degradable, about eight nanometers. And these go into the kidneys. So on this side, we have uh, the, uh, perhaps what one might expect them, slightly larger polymers uh, going in uh, to a greater extent into the liver. And these are what you might expect with zinc organs based on their, their size and also their shape. Now this linear polymer almost certainly assembles into kinetically trapped micelles, which are about 30 nanometers. But you'll see there's a gap in the middle where there's two polymers, which I haven't sh shown, and I'm now gonna show their cartoons. And this is really quite intriguing because this polymer around 10 nanometers and this polymer around 12 nanometers have very, very similar sizes by DLS, uh, but also um, very, very similar chemistries. But you can see that they're, one goes primarily to the kidneys, one goes primarily uh, to the liver. So this is intriguing. We're trying to work out why this is. We then looked at their efficacy. And we can see that they're um, in, in 3D uh, spheroids. They're both uh, more effective than free doxorubicin. We then did an in vivo study with uh, uh, an orthotopic model of triple negative breast cancer in mice. And what you can see is that at two different dosing regimes, uh, we have greater efficacy of our polymer systems compared to uh, with, uh, free doxorubicin. And perhaps more importantly, uh, we see uh, greater reduction in tumors without uh, noticeable change in body weight uh, in the mice. So these polymers essentially, um, you know, again, this is enhanced therapeutic window. Of course, many, many um, nanomedicines have been shown to do that over 20 to 30 years. But what we see is some intriguing uh, aspects in terms of their biodistribution. And we're now trying to unpick uh, in greater detail as to why some of those uh, polymers uh, transition to uh, different organs to a greater degree. And also um, whether we can uh, tune this to in enhance the tumor accumulation as opposed to uh, liver and kidney accumulation. So the last um, slide is where we're going with this. So we're looking at uh, combination drugs because clearly uh, you know, the, the classic delivery of one drug is not something that, that, that we probably want to do therapeutically. And we're looking particularly for uh, uh, radiation-based therapy is to look at a radio sensitizer and, and the lapar is our um, drug of choice. And the important thing is that if you deliver doxorubicin and the lapar together uh, via a polymer prodrug system, then you can bypass membrane pumps for resistance, but you can also co-release them as, as has already been mentioned in this, this session. And what we see is that co-delivery from a single polymer ensures we get control release rate and it guarantees that the onset of action site is the same for both materials. And when we've been delivering uh, laparid and doxorubicin, what we see is uh, enhanced 
um, efficacy uh, when we have a particular ratio of um, elaborib to doxorubicin. We're currently evaluating polymer prodrugs with both reduction and oxidative sensitive uh, linkers. Uh, this links up actually quite nicely with some of the um, things that, that Neil and also Alberto mentioned in terms of looking at um, uh, induction of, of um, oxidation and uh, ROS in, in uh, systems treated with doxorubicin and in these combinations. So we see uh, quite uh, marked uh, changes in um, ROS generation uh, with some of these polymers in triple negative breast cancer cells. We've got some promise in 3D spheroid models and um, we're doing a, a range of in vivo studies uh, at the moment. So uh, I'd like to be able to report a little bit more uh, at the next uh, clinum uh, where we're going because we're now looking at all these systems uh, and with a range of, of different uh, redox probes uh, in, in mice. So I think um, with the uh, time being as it is, uh, I'm going to conclude. So I think that polymer nanotechnologies do offer uh, many possibilities for biomedical uh, applications. I think it's important that um, you know, we understand uh, where some of our polymer nanotechnologies can contribute. Because clearly we and many, many others have shown that we can uh, treat mice. Um, and this question has been obviously important for the last um, 20 to 30 years. How do we extrapolate to humans? And I think as we get a greater understanding of, of some of our polymer systems, we understand their size, we understand their shape. We now begin to understand how they degrade and the fragments that they degrade into. And that's important from a regulatory framework. It's also important in terms of how these materials uh, might uh, accumulate in the body or uh, how they might uh, uh, transport in, in solid tumors. But also, again, if we're looking at, at uh, oxidation sensitive uh, systems, when you have inflammation, we have oxidative species, uh, oxidative sensitive polymers might accumulate in, in uh, sites of inflammation. So there are a range of things where we might use these things beyond cancer and infectious diseases where there are changes in inflammatory processes and redox as a result. But again, the more we understand about these components in mice, yes, we have to be able to, to extrapolate those to uh, oxidative or reductive processes in humans. So far, we've used materials built with chemistries adapted from those taken to phase three. But having said all that, uh, and we, we're doing this with other, with PEG PLGA and various other things, which are also um, in the clinic. But of course, we have introduced components which um, have uh, reductive, reductively or oxidatively cleavid, cleavable linkers and uh, acid sensitive linkers as well. So there are components on those polymers uh, which haven't been through the full regulatory process. So even if most of the polymer has, even the, the fact that some of those polymers the components have not been through full regulatory approval does mean that we would need to, to get a full regulatory package for them. So we're trying to re-engineer the polymers further with simpler but also more sustainable components. And I think that's an important message that we need to uh, take forward. And that needs inputs from a whole range of people Again, social science and, and, and um, as well as medics and, and my, our usual uh, suspects of chemists, biologists, pharmacists and so on. But we do really need to have social scientists to try and see uh, are these medicines going to be acceptable and can we, an economist, to see whether we can pay for them. So I think the social component is really important. We have very complex problems and they do need collective solutions. Uh, collaborations, of course, are absolutely essential for progress and uh, I leave you with the collaborations I've been very lucky to have with people uh, all over the world. And in this time of uh, global crisis, I think it's uh, all the more important that we all work together across the globe. We need global solutions to all of these problems. And that's why I think it's absolutely essential that, that uh, we work together as much as we can. With that, I'll, I'll, I'll call it Dane. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Cameron. Hope, hopefully we'll have you back for an update next year and hopefully we'll be in Basel for it. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping our fingers crossed. So we'll move rapidly on to our last speaker in the session, um, which is Alejandro Sosnik from Technion. Um, and Alejandro is going to talk to us about how to get our drugs into the CNS. Thanks, Alejandro.
for the kind invitation. Let me adjust the, the camera to see myself. Yes, indeed, we are all wishing to uh, be back in Basel next year. But in the meantime, I will share with you part of the work that we have been doing over the last years in, in my group at the Department of Material Science and Engineering of Technion in Haifa, Israel. Just one second. OK, so we have been working with uh, different types of polymeric nanoparticles for many years since my faculty uh, position at the University of Buenos Aires. And in the last years, we have been more and more focused on trying to understand and find ways to cross bio different types of biological barriers. And one of these barriers is, for example, the blood-brain barrier, which is basically governed by a tightly bound um, layer of endothelial cells. In the same way, in the uh, brain cerebrospinal fluid barrier, we have the choroid plexus epithelium that also is tightly bound. And by doing so, both barriers prevent the permeability of different types of drugs that you can find here uh, into the central nervous system. So we were looking at different approaches that try to balance complexity and translatability. And by doing so to increase the bioavailability of different types of drugs, especially small molecule drugs, hydrophobic in the CNS. So there are different approaches to achieve so that you can find the literature. One is very, very common, and I will talk about this approach with specific uh, modification later on, in which we take a nanoparticle, we coat the nanoparticle with certain ligand, and this ligand binds a receptor that is overexpressed on the apical side of, for example, the BBB endothelium, and the nanoparticles internalize, transported transcellularly across this uh, BBB endothelium layer and released at the basolateral side where we are already inside the central nervous system. We have been also looking at, for example, targeting nanoparticles, mainly polymeric, to the choroid plexus epithelium by using the same concept. But in this case, we need to look at the receptors that are overexpressed in this specific epithelium. I will not talk about this approach in this presentation due to time constraints. We have been also looking at, for example, using alternative administration routes. So for example, the nose to brain pathway. We did some preliminary work many years back in, in Buenos Aires. And more recently, we were investigating the different cellular players in this transport mechanism. And we realized, discovered somehow that microglia might play a very significant role. So if you can target microglia cells from the olfactory bulb, you might be increasing or improving the delivery of nanoparticles that are administered in the nasal mucosa into the brain. We have been using mainly polymeric nanoparticles. More recently, we are combining polymers with ceramic nanomaterials to confer some type of stimuli responsive behavior. And among the polymeric nanoparticles that we were using, we dedicated a lot of time to uh, understand and use, apply polymeric micelles, core shell polymeric micelles. And more recently, we have been using other types of polymer architectures, which are relatively simple, in which we take a hydrophilic backbone and we modify the side chain with, for example, polymethyl metacrylate, polycaprolactone, and any other hydrophobic polymer. And by generating this type of amphiphilic graph copolymers, we can, for example, generate by self-assembly multimicellar nanoparticles. By comparing the, 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 the encapsulation capacity of these nanoparticles with the conventional core shell polymeric micelles, we realized these nanoparticles can encapsulate uh, more drug. So this is the reason that we were focused on this type of structures over the last years. We can also, for example, combine, in this case, we have chitos and polymethyl metacrylate. We can combine different types of polymers in the same nanoparticle. And by doing so, to capitalize on the properties of both chitosan and PBA, polyvinyl alcohol. 
Today we'll discuss uh, a work that we did in collaboration with the group of Professor Ms. Giralt and Mary Chelte Chido at the Institute for Research in Biomed on Biomedicine in Barcelona. This group develops um, different types of peptides. And in one approach, trying to overcome the BBB, they developed the retro enantiopeptide shuttle approach in which the peptide shuttle that shuttles different types of molecules or, or nanoparticles into the central nervous system has a different amino acid sequence. And by changing the sequence, what they achieve is much longer half-life or lifespan in the bloodstream, which is critical to maintain the ligand somehow alive until the nanoparticles reach the target tissue or organ. So basically the nanoparticles that we designed this time were also based on chitosan, which, which is a positively charged uh, polysaccharide. We copolymerized methyl methacrylate, which confers the hydrophobicity to the side chain, and acrylic acid, which is negatively charged. And by doing so, we generated like inner polyelectrolyte complexes with the positively charged chitosan that reduced the critical aggregation concentration and generated a physically stable nanoparticle. The next stage was conducting the surface modification, which is critical, or at least we hypothesized that that was the critical stage to increase the permeability into the central nervous system. So here you see, for example, one of the peptide shuttles that was designed by this group. This is actually the peptide shuttle in blue. But in addition, this molecule displays other components, such as carboxyfluoresane, which enables the quantification of the amount of the peptide shuttle conjugated to the copolymer. And a very short polyethylene glycol segment uh, that has at least two different uh, roles. The first is to minimize or prevent the self-assembly of the peptide shuttle itself in water which might affect the self-assembly of the graft copolymer. And in addition, it serves as spacer, which reduces the hindrance or steric hindrance for the, a better interaction of the shuttle peptide with the target receptor. And this shuttle peptide, this peptide shuttle was conju conjugated to the side chain of the uh, chitosan PMMA polyacrylic acid copolymer by the very common EDC NHS chemistry. So once these uh, molecules are synthesized, they undergo self-assembly in water, they generate nanoparticles with a size range between 200 and 200 nano, 220 nanometers. And we demonstrated that the peptide shuttle is exposed at the surface, which is critical to target the BBB endothelium by measuring different properties uh, of the nanoparticle surface. Due to time constraints, I will focus on more on the biological studies. So the first stage was very common stage. We looked at the interaction of these nanoparticles before the modification and after the modification with the peptide shuttle with BBB endothelial cells in vitro. We demonstrated that at least for 24 hours at 37 degrees, these nanoparticles are quite cell compatible. We observed a decrease in cell viability at four degrees, which was used to characterize the internalization under conditions that prevent or minimize energy dependent pathways. So this is what you see here. This is imaging flow cytometry with the BBB endothelial cells. At 37 degrees, when the, cell, the, the nanoparticles are fluorescently labeled in green, you can see that uh, the nanoparticles are uptaken. You can quantify how many cells out of 100 are stained and even the intensity of the fluorescence. And by doing so, to compare the potential contribution of the modification or not to the uptake. At four degrees centigrade, we cannot see uh, fluorescence, which means or suggests that the internalization pathway is energy dependent. We wanted to understand better this pathway because According to uh, the Spanish collaborators, these peptide shuttles are expected to interact with the transferring receptor, which is overexpressed at the apical side of the BBB endothelium. So we used two uh, 
endocytosis inhibitors, chlorpromazine and philippine, which inhibit clatrin-mediated and calvulin-mediated endocytosis. And as you can see here, this is without the inhibitor. And when we compare the internalization in the presence of these two inhibitors, we observe that there is a significant decrease in the internalization of both types of nanoparticles, but the effect was more pronounced for the peptide shuttle modified nanoparticles in the presence of chlorpromazine, which suggests that the internalization is clattering mediated, and this would be in line with the interaction with the transparent receptor. The next stage was looking at permeability, first in vitro, and then looking at the bioavailability of the nanoparticles in vivo. So for the in vitro study, we grow the BBB endothelial cells on a semi-permeable membrane. We measure the confluence or we test the confluence by measuring the trans endothelial electrical resistance. And once the monolayers are ready, what we do is to, to pour the nanoparticles, which are fluorescently labeled, in a donor chamber and track the permeability in the acceptor chamber. And as you can see here, after the modification with the peptide shuttle, the nanoparticles display a significantly higher apparent permeability, which was encouraging, but still we are in vitro, where the BBB endothelial cell monolayer is not uh, perfect. So the next stage was moving to the first preclinical studies. In this case, what we did is to uh, label the nanoparticles by using two types one type of, of label, which is a near infrared tracer. And we injected the nanoparticles intravenously to mouse, sacrificed the animals at different time points, and we imaged the, the, the isolated brains at different time points and compared the average fluorescence radiance that we can measure by using the bioimaging instrument. So these are the unmodified nanoparticles you can see very, very light fluorescence after one or two hours. This was plotted here. We can see that the accumulation of the, the nanoparticles is relatively low. This is a control. Then we conducted the same experiment by using the peptide shuttle modified nanoparticles. Here, even after 10 minutes, we can already detect uh, the nanoparticles in the brain, the intensity is maximum after two hours, and then we see a decline. If we measure or calculate the area under the curve in these two curves, we observe an increase in the uh, bioavailability in the brain of approximately four times, which is encouraging. Obviously, and this is general for any targeting approach, when you target a nanoparticle to a target tissue or organ, you reduce the accumulation in off-target tissues and organs. And if you encapsulate uh, an anti-cancer drug, you can eventually reduce the side effects. We wanted to characterize uh, the accumulation of the nanoparticles by using a different method. And here we used light sheet fluorescence microscopy. And for this kind of experiment, we conduct exactly the same administration. The difference is that the nanoparticles were fluorescently labeled with rhodamine, which is uh, red fluorescence. And after half an hour, which is the time point at which we uh, determine the maximum accumulation for the modified nanoparticles, we sacrificed the animals, we isolated the brains, we fixed them, and we visualized them by this technique. So here you can see an untreated brain. This is uh, the autofluorescence of the tissue under the uh, wavelength that we use for the study. These are the unmodified nanoparticles. So you can see here the video. There is some accumulation in the brain parenchyma, but we cannot really see very well uh, the brain blood vessels, as opposed to the peptide shuttle modified nanoparticles in which we can really identify the blood vessels and we can see an increase in the accumulation or at least of the fluorescence in the brain parenchyma of approximately two to three times compared to the unmodified nanoparticles. This uh, project was also a collaboration with a very good friend, uh, Dr. Angel Carcaboso, uh, who is an expert in the design and development of preclinical models of pediatric tumors by taking uh, 
patient biopsies and autopsies and growing them in, in, ma in mouse or different types of, of, of mouse. And in this project, we were especially interested in uh, delivering the anti-cancer drug SM38, which is a camptotensin, very potent uh, anti-cancer drug, which kills diffuse intrinsic point and glioma cells in vitro, but has no efficacy in vivo by using the DIPG model that Angel developed at the hospitals and Juan de Deo in Barcelona. So here you see some facts of DIPG. Um, and I would like to stress this point. As opposed to other brain tumors, in DIPG, the BBB is fully conserved. So we face the same problems as we face in other CNS diseases. We will not be able to de deliver any drug from the systemic circulation into the brain. So since I don't have time to describe all this work, I will just give you a, a very small taste of the work that we did uh, by trying to deliver this drug in the IPG. So we encapsulated SN38 in these two types of nanoparticles without and with the modification. And we tracked the nanoparticles by using, again, light sheet fluorescence microscopy and showing you uh, results after half an hour. So this is an untreated brain. Again, we see some autofluorescence. The unmodified nanoparticles, almost the same story. We see a very light uh, fluorescence in the brain parenchyma. We cannot identify the brain blood vessels. And then again, when we use these modified nanoparticles, we can identify at least part of the blood vessels. And we see an increase in the CNS, which is the fluorescence that we see here, of the CNS accumulation in the brain of two to three times with respect to the unmodified nanoparticles. So we are still working on this part of the project. I will summarize by saying that we have a very uh, versatile modular platform to uh, encapsulate different types of hydrophobic drugs, including uh, their modification and targeting to different body sites. I would like to thank my group, especially Alexandra Bukchin, who led this, uh, this project, funding agencies, especially your Nanomed and my collaborators. And thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for the kind invitation and your kind attention. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, superb, very interesting project. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm mindful that we don't have an awful lot of time uh, left for discussion. We do have uh, several questions um, on the system. Can I ask the speakers to turn their cameras on, please? Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I think first, Cameron, you had a question for Alberto, I think. Can we take that question first? Yeah, Alberto, fascinating talk. Um, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, redox and, and so on. And you mentioned that there was excess thiol generation in uh, some of the systems that you studied following radiation. And can you just get roughly how long that lasted and, and uh, you know, whether that was a particularly transient effect or sustained? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. We, we see an excess of, uh, of uh, molecules with free thiols. <coughs> which are leaking from cells damaged by radiotherapy. This is seen in in, in vitro cytotoxicity assays in which cells are irradiated and uh, they, they are actually given sublethal sub irradiation. And, and then uh, these experiments were done uh, by Dr. Andrew Wang at University of Northern Carolina. And he was able to collect the medium from these uh, sublethally irradiated cells and, uh, and then use this medium to activate uh, the prodrug. Uh, so, so now about kinetics, I, I cannot say really if this lasts, but it, it, it appears to me that this is a very, very relatively rapid effect. It takes a few hours and then cells either uh, recover or um, and stop uh, shedding these this, uh, thiol groups or, um, or die. If, if the damage is too too great so that's but i, I we, we haven't done any kinetic studies yeah. that's what i can say that's really interesting yeah. 
So we, we had an, another question for you, Alberto, from Natalie Mignier. Um, and she noted that in your lipid peg, you used a disulfide link, but that that uh, material was stopped early for toxicity issues. And the question was whether the linker was the same for the lipid pool drug. The, the linker that we use is um, I mean I don't have access right now to the presentation, but it's it's it actually it's a uh, dithiobenzyl uh, linker. It it is um, when you actually activate the product, it will uh, release the thioquinone methyl uh, group, which is quinone methyl is is a, by the way a byproduct of tamoxifen metabolism. Okay and. Uh, and because mitomycin C is a very powerful drug, by the way, um, quinone methods may theoretically be toxic. If that is what the question is about, I'm not so sure that the question is about it. Uh, but uh, we, we know that because mitomycin C is so potent, we are using the amounts that we are using in, in treating patients will not generate any significant amount of quinone method or thioquinone method uh, it will be much lower than what a patient treated with tamoxifen will be exposed to. So I don't think there is a safety question here. I hope I answer the question. I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have another question from Raphael Levy. Um, and I think this one's to you, Alejandro. Um, and, the, and the question is, um, in your... In in vitro uh, assays, you presented results for proportion of the unmodified particles. Um, and the question relates to the absolute numbers. So what is the percentage of particles in the donor chamber that access the receptor chamber, the receiver chamber? Do you, do you have any data on that? You're on mute, Alejandro. Sorry, sorry. Um, I, I had that that number in the presentation, but I wanted to make it more concise. But the number for the modified nanoparticles is, is above 50 percent after the four hours test. OK, uh, so we see a very, very significant difference between the two, the two curves. Again, this BBB endothelial cell model is quite tricky because these cells don't produce very tight, tight junctions. So it's not really perfect. So you need to compare two different types of particles. You cannot get kind of absolute numbers, but it's about 50%, more or less, yeah. for the modified nanoparticles. For the unmodified, it's much lower. Well, yeah. After four hours. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, so I've got a few questions for the speakers, but before I ask some of those, do any of the speakers have questions for other speakers? Yeah, I have one question to Ryan. Yeah, very interesting talk. I, I was wondering how the micro needles perform when you want to deliver two drugs that even if they are hydrophobic, they display a quite different water solubility. So because you could have drugs that dissolve a few micrograms ml and drugs that are still hydrophobic and dissolve several hundreds of micrograms ml. So do you see any difference in the pharmacokinetics and, and so on? Sure. <clears throat> it's a really important question, Alejandro. And I suppose that the way we've always looked at this is that the microneedles themselves are, are really only a tool to put the real delivery system, which in this case would be the, the nanoparticles, into the viable skin layers. And so, you know, what we would typically aim to do would be to design microneedles that can contain the maximum possible loading of whatever the drug is. So, you know, we've delivered hydrophilic molecules as well. You know, the, the likes of ibuprofen sodium, you can deliver hundreds of milligrams across the skin using microneedle patches if your patch is sufficiently big because the molecule is so water soluble and you're creating the aqueous pores. But with, with the likes of rilpivirine and cabotegravir, there is a difference in, in aqueous solubility between the two of them. They're both pretty water insoluble, but 
I think well, piperine is even more water insoluble than, than capotegravir. And we we actually weren't loading them into the same patch, if you like. So we we would make a segmented patch. So, so you know, each one would contain a different drug formulation so that if there was going to be any physical interaction between nanoparticles, it wouldn't actually be happening within the delivery system itself. Um, so, so really, it's I think that largely the properties of the, the particle that are controlling drug absorption in this case, you know, particle size and the solubility of the drug in the available fluid in the skin. I've got a conceptual question for you, Ryan. Um, for the for the microarray patches, in comparison to perhaps more invasive approaches like the injectables and the implantables, um, is is one week enough? I mean, you can comfortably get to one week. Do we, do you really need to push it beyond that for a for a map? Yeah, and I, I think it's a really good question from a a practicality point of view, and and you know, I suppose that we have been um, focused in some ways on the demands of sponsors of, of work in that, you know, whenever um, grant work will have been funded, you know, the original intention from the sponsor might be to see just how long the delivery could be for and They try to have a direct comparison with an injection. So you would always start off stating that the four weeks delivery would be what's desirable, but in some cases, the drug dose is such that the patch size in that case would be kind of the size of somebody's torso and therefore wouldn't be a, a practical um, product. But, you know, as I said during the talk, my experience of, of working in community pharmacy over 10 years in parallel with my academic career is that people probably would remember to apply a patch um, once a week, whereas I think that they may struggle to remember to apply it once a month. And so, you know, what our preference really is that it would be a weekly patch as opposed to something that would be applied on a, on a monthly basis. Thank you, Ryan. And any other questions from the other speakers? Cameron? Yeah, I had one for, for Neil, actually. Uh, so when you looked at um, uh, polarization and also say um, some of the ROS generation, uh, there's been a whole set of uh, reports about amphiphilic polymers causing this because of membrane, you know, mitochondrial membrane disruption. Is that something you've seen in your assays where, because obviously you showed the data for the drugs themselves, but maybe I missed it in terms of some of the excipients that you added. So we haven't looked at the excipients specifically. Um, we've tended to focus on, I guess you could say that the, the whole platform technology, because obviously that's what, you know, um, theoretically all of the cell is going to see. Um, but it's certainly something that we can consider for the future. Because I think obviously one of the, with, with the solid drug nanoparticle platform, the other excipients in there, that, well, there aren't that many of them really, and they're things that well, cells have seen before, if you like, you know, there's nothing hugely exciting. Because of the, um, the high drug loading in them as well, I think most likely it's something to do with the, just the amount of drug that's in there, but where it goes. I think that's, that's certainly the thing. Um, but it's definitely worth considering, I think, for the really sort of more complex materials like the like the polymeric ones that you were mentioning. Obviously, we don't really know how they all sort of degrade in different compartments in the cells. So it's certainly something we'd be interested to follow up with with uh, with those more complex materials. Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question for Alejandro. Uh, Alejandro, in your uh, fluorescent images of the brain. Uh, using the peptide, uh, the peptide derivatized nanoparticles, I noticed that the the blood vessels seem to have quite a strong staining. So I was wondering, it, do you get some material stuck in the endothelial cells that is that never is transcytosed towards the parenchyma? Uh, what is the kinetics of this process? Well, we don't know the kinetics, but that's a an excellent point and we need to study that okay because it, it could be that part of the nanoparticles that bind the blood vessels stay stuck there and they cannot cross into the the brain parenchyma and only part of that goes into the brain parenchyma if we measure the fluorescence in uh, the brain parenchyma uh, without the nanoparticles or with the unmodified nanoparticles and the modified nanoparticles we'll still see an increase in the fluorescence of around threefold, 
but still we don't know if all the nanoparticles that, that bind the blood vessels are inter internalized or transported into the brain brain. And the additional study that we need to do is the uh, is checking the anti-cancer activity of the drug loaded nanoparticles by using the DIPG model in vivo, which is the last part of the project that we didn't do because of all this situation of the coronavirus. We couldn't finalize this part by the last time of, of the PhD thesis. But that would be the, the, the confirmation that we still see uh, the pharmacological effect. Just related to that, Alejandro, it, it appeared to me that the initial rate of clearance from the brain of the functionalized material seemed to be more rapid than that of the unmodified material. Have you looked at stability in the brain homogenate or stability of the material in that matrix? No, all the, all the stability studies that we, we did are in the regular media that we use in the lab. Uh, for example, in uh, cell culture medium or PBS. And in this media, the nanoparticles stay assembled but we don't know what happens in vivo, okay? That's something that's still pending. And I mean, the, the idea of stabilizing them by using different types of weak uh, chemical bonds, electrostatic interactions is basically to try to maintain them assembled even under extreme conditions. We demonstrated that in vitro, but not in vivo yet. Okay, well, with that, unfortunately, gentlemen, we're out of time. But um, I'll, I'll uh, thank you all once again for fantastic presentations. Really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll be in Basel together this time next year. And thanks, thanks so for everyone much. listening thank online. You. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.